Hello everyone, and welcome to Austintronics. In the last video, I showed you six principal movements that are used to solve more advanced transformations. In this video, I'll show you how to put those principal movements to use by demonstrating scenarios you are most likely to encounter. Let's say you have a robotic arm and you're wanting the end effector to grab an object. You must first assign a coordinate system to both the end effector and the object of interest. For now, you can put the coordinate system on the end effector and the object any way you want. As we get deeper into the tutorials, there will be preferred ways in selecting coordinate systems when dealing specifically with multi-jointed robotic arms. When it comes to picking the coordinate system for the objects, however, it is often up to you to decide how you place them. Now let's say I wanted to grab the object from behind. This just so happens to make both frame 0 and frame 1 have aligned axes for x, y, and z. The big question you're going to have to be asking yourself on almost every type of these problems are, what principal movements must I execute in order to get one frame to another? Using the principal movements I went over in the last video, we know that a rotation transformation about Z will look like this. In this case, I would like to rotate about Z by 180 degrees, and then use a translation movement in the Y direction by negative A to align the frames. To find your transformation matrix between these two frames, simply multiply the matrices together. We know that these rotten trans functions will result to these two matrices, and from here, the multiplication will provide the final transformation matrix. So what cool things can we do with this matrix? Well, aside from being able to multiply transformation matrices together to obtain far more advanced movements, you can also get the angle between one another's axes. Let me show you what I mean. If I wanted to get the angle between the end effector's x-axis and the object's x-axis, I would just take the arc cosine of the first element of the matrix, which would be 180 degrees. Why take the arc cosine of the first element? Well, imagine you put an imaginary grid of x, y's, and z's on your transformation matrix around the rotation region. By selecting the appropriate row and column to take the arc cosine of, you can obtain the degrees between any axis. Let's try this with the angle between the z-axis of the end effector and the y-axis of the object. The arc cosine of 0 is 90 degrees, which is certainly the angle between the z and y axes. Although the angle between the axes may be found by observation now, once we start combining the principal movements to solve more advanced transformations, it will start becoming too complex to tell the angle between the axes by simple observation, therefore making this technique more important as we move on. Another way transformation matrices can be used is to give an object in space a change in perspective with respect to a given frame. For example, let's say I want two robotic arms working together to grab a heavy object. The object with respect to the end effector at frame 1 is going to be different coordinates than the end effector at frame 0. If we know the coordinates of the object with respect to frame 1, and we know the transformation matrix between the two frames, then we can figure out the coordinates with respect to frame 0. In this case, the coordinates of the object with respect to frame 1 is 2 units in the x, 4 units in the y, and 4 units in the z. All we must do to get the coordinates with respect to frame 0 is multiply the known coordinates by the transformation matrix. However, a 4x4 matrix cannot multiply by a 3x1 matrix because their inner dimensions don't match. We can turn this vector into an augmented vector by adding a 1 to an additional dimension. This will make the inner dimensions between both matrices the same, allowing them to be multiplied by one another. Also notice the notation change for the vector when switching to an augmented vector. It sometimes can be confusing knowing which vector should be multiplied with the transformation to give us the other resulting vector. While we use the only vector that we had available to us, that doesn't mean you can start multiplying vectors by transformation matrices to get other unknown vectors. You must pay close attention to the source and destination frames the transformation is mapping to. The transformation matrix that we have happens to be from frame 0 to frame 1, as denoted by the notation on the T. To know if you're multiplying the correct vector by the transformation matrix, take a look at the notation of vector U. The 1 on vector U shows that the coordinates 2, 4, 4 are with respect to frame 1. The 1 on top of vector U and the 1 on the bottom of matrix T should cancel, leaving only 0 on top of matrix T. This carries over to the resulting vector, showing that it is with respect to frame 0. After the multiplication, you'll get this augmented vector. Because we don't want to represent our coordinates as an augmented vector, we will remove the extra dimension. Another cool property of transformation matrices is that you can switch the source and destination of a transformation by taking its inverse. 
It just so happens if you did this for the transformation we've been working with, it becomes the same matrix. Because the transformation is now from frame 1 to frame 0, we can multiply by vector u with respect to 0 to get vector u with respect to 1 if that was the vector that was originally unknown. The resulting augmented vector would be 2441, which is what you would expect since this is what we first started with. Thank you all for watching and I hope you all are enjoying the video series thus far. Make sure you like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.